All right. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. We are continuing our series on parenting, and Lord willing, this is the last portion on discipline. And here, we're getting to the nitty-gritty today. We're going to talk about, we talked about principles for discipline, we talked about um, practical application, and now we're going to talk specifically about tools. So I, I'm not planning on discipline, like we're not exercising these tools. I don't know why everybody ran off and we've got less people here today. <laughs> No, I'll assume if they, if they need it, they'll be online or catch it later. Um, this whole series will be on YouTube. I'll probably organize it in a playlist once we get done. Um, and I will have material, um, I'll have notes available that kind of summarize everything. So if this has been useful and you think, hey, that's a lot of material, or you touched on a lot and covered a lot and don't remember it all, um, come see me. I have notes. I can give you a copy of my notes. All right, so discipline, part three, tools and traps. We'll probably touch more on the tools than the traps, but, uh, well, let's just get into it. And uh, as a quick refresher, we started talking about principled parenting. And I have a, a slide there to show you the fun foundational principles. We talked about what principles were, the principled approach. We talked about our priorities, that God is first, and that upon our relationship with Him, we can build a relationship with our spouse. And upon that relationship, we can build a relationship with our kids. And then upon our family, we can then minister to the rest of the world. We talked about our responsibility to God for our kids, that they're gifts. We talked about respecting their freedom of choice, um, the main goal of parenting, to raise uh, well-rounded adults that are e equipped for everything they need in life. This idea of autonomy versus dependence, that they start completely dependent, they end up completely autonomous, that they are already full people. Uh, they're not being constructed, they're just growing, but they're Full people, God has already put them in place. We're playing the long game, and then we talked about unconditional love. Um, and then in the last couple of weeks, we talked about principles of effective discipline. Uh, I'll go through those really quickly just to kind of set the stage for what we're doing here. We said we define discipline in this context specifically as self-control. And as our goal as parents to instill self-control in our children so that they have the ability to make choices purposefully in line with their goals. Ultimately, they're going to have their own goals. Hopefully, we influence those and we shape them as they grow, but our job as parents is to equip them to pursue their own goals. We talked about uh, targeting thoughts. We start there. We want to get in their head. We want them to think the right thoughts, so, and that will lead to right behavior. We want them to, to have the tools to uh, govern their own mind. Uh, and we talked about this being about teaching and growing, not about passing judgment or punishing. So discipline is not about what's fair to the kid. Discipline is about what is good for them to grow. Um, fairness is probably a value you're trying to instill, but my discipline is not about, you know, well, you did this, therefore I have to punish you. It's, well, you did this, how can I teach you to do what's right? So that was how we define discipline. I gave you a couple um, principles for effective discipline. One was uh, neuroplasticity, and we'll go to the next slide when we can, um, which is Remember the way that our brains work, that neurons that wire, uh, fire together, wire together. Or another way to say it is what we practice is what we become. So if you want to teach your children something, you can't just tell it to them. You have to model it to them. You have to put them in a situation where they can exercise it. And what they do will change how their brain is wired. So keep that in mind as we're thinking about this. We talked about cause and effect being a foundational principle for discipline, that this is about consequences for actions and choices and talked about uh, appropriate and uh, acceptable behavior, which will come up in all of our conversation here. And then finally, last week, I left you with these principles, and then we'll touch on how we use them. We talked about consequences, the fact that uh, good discipline is about consequences being felt. You need to have real consequences as much as possible. Um, prefer to just highlight real consequences, only add artificial ones when the real ones are not effective for one reason or another. Avoid being arbitrary. If you do have to create artificial consequences, tie them to the behavior being addressed. Be predictable so your children know what to expect. They know the rules. They're not surprised when consequences come. And uh, we have to be consistent in our consequences. The second one I had was preserve freedom. And I changed this a little bit because I wanted to make a little more emphasis here. Uh, coercion is uh, unavoidable when you're talking about discipline. Again, I'll use the... the Trivial example, I'm not going to let my toddler run into the street. I will physically restrain them. They do not have a choice. I am coercing them because it's good for them, because they're not equipped to handle that freedom. But as much as possible, I want to limit that. 
knowing it's, it's necessary, my goal is to uh, preserve their freedom. I want to choose uh, tools. We're going to talk about these tools today. As you think about using these tools, make sure you choose ones you can sustain. Don't uh, paint yourself into a corner where you either have to do something you really don't want to do or go back on your word and be inconsistent. You want to be consistent and tell the truth. If you do this, this is the consequence. They'll learn if that's not true. So choose tools you can sustain. Be outcome-oriented. Uh, the goal is to shape our children, to give them skills, not to, uh, you know, if, if we have some discipline we've imposed, um, we can be flexible as long as we're achieving the goal that we're trying. That's, that's our goal. We talked about this being an investment of time in our children. Uh, we talked about discipline being child-led. Unconditional love is about the giver. I can love you regardless of how you feel about me. And discipline is about the receiver. Uh, God will discipline me according to what I need. It's not so much about anyone else or even you know, as a parent how I feel. It's about what my child needs um, to grow. We talked about being fair and uh, being intentional. That's that don't get trained to be mean. Don't just react. We'll touch on that one a little bit more here. So those were kind of the, I know I, I went through those really quickly. Uh, I talked about them in depth last week um, and in the previous weeks with the previous principles. But I wanted to get those back in our head to kind of remind us of where we were. Only took five minutes to get there, so we've got time to go through the rest of it. All right, let's be very, uh, let's get rubber meets the road. Um, there's one thing I mentioned last week I want to touch on before we talk about the specific tools. And that is this idea that compliance is gained by action. I think I have a slide for that one. Yeah. So I gave you this, this example pattern of, you know, you have a kid that's uh, maybe watching something on the iPad or playing a video game, and you tell them, you know, you've got 15 more minutes, and then I need you to go take out the trash or do the, or do the dishes, whatever, right? And they say, okay, Mom, yeah, I got it. Or, okay, Dad, I got it. And then, you know, 15 minutes goes by, and they don't take out the trash. So you come and say, hey, I told you, you know, 15 minutes is up. You need to go take out the trash. And they say, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm just finishing up. I'll go take out the trash. Ten minutes later, you come back, and they're still on the screen. They haven't taken the trash out. Now, it's, didn't I tell you tw 25 minutes ago you had 15 minutes, and now I came back, and you still haven't taken out the trash? Yeah, Mom, I'll get it. And this repeats until finally, you know, Mom or Dad comes in and is yelling and mad and screaming at them, and then finally the kid goes and does it. And... Uh, you know, at that point, everyone's very emotional. Uh, but in, this, in that example, the parent is allowing the child to train them to react out of anger. Uh, after all, it's only when the parent got enraged and angry that the child complied, that the behavior uh, you know, was rewarded. So, and similarly, the child is being taught that uh, it doesn't really matter until mom and dad get mad. Right? Then they're going to do something. But until they start screaming and yelling... I can ignore them, it's fine, there's no real consequences. What does the child complain about oftentimes in a situation like that? That you're way overreacting. Right. Which, you're correct. Right. Because I didn't do the behavior before, but yeah, now I am way overreacting. So. Because it's become this, now it's not about, it's the fact that you've ignored me. But you're in control of that. That's the thing, as the parent, you are in control of that. And it's easy to think, well, you know, it's only when I got mad. That's, that's, if you're not intentional, you train yourself that it only works when I, I have to blow up, I have to scream at you. How many of you, you've had kids, you ever stop and it's like, why do I have to scream at you for you to pay attention to me? And it's like, it's a question we ask the kids, and oh, our impl implication is, you should have learned before, I shouldn't have to scream at you. Well, yes, but the real question is, why don't you do something before you scream? Because the, the truth is, compliance is gained by action. It wasn't actually the screaming that gained compliance. It was mom or dad going into the room and taking the screen and making the kid do it, is the action that gained compliance. So effective compliance requires action. If, if we, hypothetically in that scenario, if we had put the parent in a cage and they couldn't get out and they could only yell, cajole, scream, threaten, the child would not, very high likelihood, especially if they knew they weren't going to get out, the child's not going to do anything until they want to because it was action. The rage didn't actually, wasn't actually effective. So... Rage, anger, threats, begging, counting, none of those gain compliance. Don't train your child to ignore you by going through all these motions but not acting. And to Brother Goss's point, we need to take action before we get emotionally volatile. You know, it's an overreaction. Well, yes, I'm the parent. I'm the adult here. I'm the one who let myself get so worked up. 
I have to recognize that and say, okay, if this doesn't get done, I'm going to be upset, so I'm going to take action now and make sure it happens uh, and attach consequences if I need to. We get to choose how angry we're going to be. And this actually, we're modeling to our children how to handle uh, conflict, how to handle noncompliance. Uh, we're teaching them how to handle it calmly or how to not handle it calmly. And then um, expect compliance on the first request. Uh, this, I'll be honest, this is one that took us a while to, to really lean into because sometimes it can feel like you're, like you're being a jerk. It's like, well, you don't give them a chance. Like, they just have to do it. Well, yes, but that's, that's what's expected. Like, if I go to work and my boss says, hey, can you, you, know, can you reach out to so-and-so instead of meeting to do this? If I don't do it until he comes back and asks me again, he's going to be upset or at least puzzled. Like, did, was I unclear? Did you not understand? Like, if I understood the request and it's a reasonable request, I'd do it the first time. There's, so here's the thing. If you don't feel justified in expecting and enforcing compliance with your request, don't make the request. If, you, if it's important enough that it needs to be done, then you need to be prepared to back that up. So compliance is gained by action. This isn't being cruel. This is just being fair. And then there's one other thing I wanted to touch on, and I don't remember if I have a slide. Go to the next one real quick, and we'll see. I do not have a slide. Bummer. Uh, we're about to talk about specific tools. And at the outset, I want to point out all coercive tools of discipline, and that's what many of these are, let's be honest with ourselves, all coercive tools of discipline can be abusive. And so before we think about them, we have to put ourselves in the right mindset to be loving to our children. So a couple keys here. Negative consequences, we have to keep crystal clear in our mind because our children are going to mix this up and we have to be able to, to help them to separate it back out and understand. Negative consequences are about their behavior, not who they are. Right? They've earned the negative consequences by their poor choices, but not because they inherently deserve punishment. And if we're not careful, that's something we can teach our children is that you are bad, you are a bad kid, you are an angry kid, you are a whatever, and therefore just inherently you deserve this stuff. So no, there are specific behaviors that we are addressing, but you get to choose what kind of person you are going to be, and you are not inherently this or that. Negative and positive consequences are a form of manipulation. Uh, Y'all have probably heard me... Um, uh, to make this point in general, in communication, any rhetorical device, any persuasive conversation is fundamentally manipulation. We don't think of it as manipulation because usually it's in good faith. We have to recognize the same tools that we use to make good faith arguments to be persuasive are the same tools that someone who wants to manipulate will use to manipulate people. It's about intent, right? So we are trying to put them in situations that reinforce specific choices. This is a very careful thing we have to do here because and we, we have to be careful to make sure we're doing what's best for the child. If we can't explain and justify our uh, incentives and consequences to our children, that should give us pause and say like, wait a minute, is this really what's best for them? If I can't tell them why it matters, am I doing this out of the right spirit? Right. If you can't explain it to your spouse or to another adult that you trust and who's on board, if you can explain to them why you've chosen the specific measure of disciplines you've chosen, again, that should be kind of a red flag. Like, am, am I doing this because it's what's best for the kid? If I, if I don't even know how it's best for them, there's danger that I'm doing it just not thinking or there's a danger for it to be uh, not healthy. Another thing I'll point out is all discipline requires you to spend relational capital. If you think about a relationship like a bank, like a bank account, you make deposits, right? Y'all have probably heard this analogy before. Whenever I have a, a positive interaction, I, I ask how they're doing, I, I care about them, I, I play with them, I work with them. As I spend time with them, I'm depositing into that bank. And there's times where I'm going to have to make withdrawals. I'm going to re require them to listen to me, to comply with me against their will. I'm going to have to teach them, the, going to require patience from them while I explain things to them. I'm making withdrawals. So if I don't have enough of a deposit built up, I'm going to get to the point where I'm pulling and pulling and pulling and they stop listening and they stop caring because I've overdrawn my relational capital. Research has uh, recommended a minimum of five positive interactions for every negative interaction. 
I think that's low, personally. Uh, and I don't think we have to play a game about it, right? It's, this isn't like, I've got to keep my tally. Did I tell him, oh, good boy, good job, you know, like, make sure I got my five. But I do want to be intentional about having lots of good, positive interaction. You would think this would be easy, but if your kids are in school, if you, have, if you work a full-time job, if you have other responsibilities on top of your job, it's easy to get so busy that you just go about your day and you don't really interact with your kids until there's something you're correcting them about. And that's not wrong. It's good to discipline and correct your That's what we're talking about. But if that's your primary interaction with them, it's going to be very hard to have a positive relationship. And discipline requires that relational capital. The last thing I'll point out about the, the dangers of uh, tools of discipline and how they can be abusive if we're not careful is we have to avoid humili- humiliating our child. Um, you have to be careful, especially if you have multiple children, not to use one child's punishment or discipline as an example for the others. It's okay to talk about, you know, say, like, I, I've sent, for example, I've sent some of my kids to their room and the other kid asks, hey, you know, what's, what's going on? Well, you know, Elijah's in his room and he's, I'm going to have to have a conversation with him about something that happened. But that's it. I'm not going to have that in the middle of the living room unless they're all involved, right? If, I, if it's like something that all three of them did something, we're going to talk about this together as a family and figure it out. But if I'm just dealing with Elijah, for example, I'm going to take him to his room and talk to him. If I have to spank one of my children, I'm going to do it privately in a, in a room away. Because there's an element of shame to correction and discipline. And that's, that's a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But it can be a bad thing. It can be an unhealthy thing. You know, I want my children to grow up with a healthy sense of shame that they can use as an input to decide, is this behavior appropriate? Am I going to, you know, is this good? For example, I don't want my kids going and screaming in the library, right? I think we'd all, you should feel ashamed of that. Or if you all ever see those TikToks or YouTubes where, like, people go up and slap someone upside the back of the head in the grocery store. And it's like, what are you thinking? How, how can you do that and film it and put it on the internet and feel no shame? You should feel shamed for your behavior. But shame, we don't want the shame to control them and press down their, their self-value. We want them to have a healthy uh, respect for good behavior, respect for the consideration of others. And if we're not careful in how we discipline, we can instill a sense of shame that's not healthy for them. So we have to avoid humiliating our children in discipline. All right, so let's talk about the tools of discipline. We'll see how we get through this. I don't want to rush through it, but I do want to touch on a lot of it. I'll, I put this one on here because I, I can't underscore this enough. I talked about it at length last time, so I won't go too much today. But the natural consequences are the most effective tool for discipline. So if they're there, don't pass them up. Connect your child's behavior to the outcome of that behavior. If they screamed at a friend and their friend doesn't want to come over anymore, show them. Look, why is Susie not come over? Because you are very unkind, and that was not, that's not pleasant. That's not the kind of person that wants to be friends with. So that's why we don't scream. Right? Especially when they're younger, but even as they're old, help them to connect the dots. Right? Um, you do have to be balanced and loving. Right? This isn't just, I told you so. I told you if you did that, you do. But it's, do you see? Do you understand how you hurt yourself? That's the behavior. All right, let me go to the next one. And I don't know um, if this is one that people would commonly think of as a tool for discipline. If you'll notice, all three of these are, are positive, they're affirmative tools for discipline. Um, negotiated agreement, I think, is one of the most powerful tools for disciplining your child. Remember, discipline is teaching. It's not necessarily, you know, punishing. That's not discipline. It's teaching. So go to the next slide if you can. Negotiated agreement. The operating principle behind negotiated agreement is the recognition that oftentimes, maybe even a majority of the time, our children's poor behavior is not the result of intentional, willful malice, but it's just inappropriate desires, or desires are inappropriately expressed. And a lot of times these desires aren't wrong in of themselves, they're just not appropriate for the circumstances, or not appropriately expressed, or they're inconsiderate. So if we can, let's talk to our kids and work with them to recognize what they actually want, and then help them to rephrase that in a way that's appropriate. Model for them the behavior that appropriately expresses their desire. So this is, I want to say yes more than I say no. I'm looking for an excuse to say yes to my children. I don't want to just be a no machine. Can I have candy? No. Can I go outside? No. Can I play with a friend? No. Can I do this? No. No. I want to find a way to say yes. Most of the time, 
when we have to say no, our kids don't start by being obstinate. Usually, you know, I don't think, like, my kids wake up and think, today I'm going to make mom and dad's lives miserable. I'm just going to do everything they don't want me to do and resist them at every turn. Some days it feels like they wake up that way. And it does feel like some children are more prone to that than others. But usually they have a goal, a desire that they want, and either it's not good for them or the way they're pursuing it is harmful or inappropriate or inconsiderate, etc. In that case, why don't I say yes, but help them to find a healthy way to say yes? I try to default to yes. If I have to say no, I kind of think, why, do, why am I saying no? What would be an appropriate way for them to do this? And there's a couple reasons for this. You want them to trust that your no is in their best interest. You want them not to argue with you when you say no, right? I mean, they're going to at times. But you want them, even when they argue, to have this feeling inside their heart that mom's not just being capricious, dad's not just saying that to be a jerk. He, if he's saying no, he means it because there's a reason. And so step one is you act, it has to actually be in their best interest, right? If you're just saying no for your own whims, they're going to learn that. Kids are smart. They'll pick it up. Step two is you have to help them understand how this is in their best interest. So these are those teaching opportunities, but you're not going to be able to teach them unless you have a firm grasp yourself on why it matters. Um, and it is, you know, I'm not saying you don't say no. There are lots of opportunities to say no. You're, you're going to as a parent. And sometimes it's okay to say no to your children, even if it's just about you. I'll, I'll use an example from us. Um, I think I may share this one earlier, but we, there was a, a night that the girls wanted to go swimming, and it was like 8.30 at night, or 8 o'clock at night. They wanted to go next door to uh, granddaddy and grandmommy's and go swimming. And our rule is you have to be home at 9, because I want you in bed by 9.30, and you can go to sleep. We're not going to you know, bonk you on the head and force you to go to sleep, but you need to be at least be in your room by 9.30, right? So theoretically, they have an hour to swim. But they ask, and the answer is no. Well, why not? We, we have plenty of time to swim. We'll be home by 9. Well, no, you won't. I, I know we're going to have to go over there, and we're going to have to drag you out of the water and pull you out and argue with you and control you and then maybe physically get you and pull you out of the water and get you home and make you bathe, and then it's going to be late, and I just don't have energy for that tonight. I'm too tired. There's too much of the day. It's already gone by. And I recognize, it was actually my wife who recognized this, I, I don't have the bandwidth to 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 enforce the rules that I have in place. So kind of like the, I'm not going to wait until I get screaming and yelling. I'm going to recognize I have to say no right now. And, you know, ultimately we had that conversation with them. We explained them they didn't like it. But the answer was, okay, you've proven to us that, that we, you, we can't trust you to be home at 9. We'll do it this time. No, you won't. If you really want to, do it next time, and we'll establish a pattern from there. So, but recognize that, you know, it is okay to say no because you don't have bandwidth. But what you're doing with this negotiating to yes is you're, you're reinforcing to them this idea that they matter, that their choices matter, that you want what's best for them, that mom and dad want to say yes. We want you to have fun. We want you to have the things we want. We want you to enjoy life. We want you to play with your friends. But we want you to do so in a way that's healthy, appropriate, socially acceptable, considerate of others. So negotiated agreement. Here's, here's how to do this. Some tips, anyways. Um, you know, what do they want to do? First thing, what, what are they trying to do? Well, why not? What's, what's the harm in them getting what they want or doing what they want? Okay, I've identified the, the way they're going about it's wrong or they don't need that much candy or whatever. Well, is there a way that I could change their behavior so they can get what they want? If there is, great. Can I teach them and help them to adapt? Okay, you want candy? Well, you know, we can have so much a day, and here's what you do, and if you really want it, you shouldn't have eaten the muffin earlier, or, you know, however it is, or you want to play with so-and-so, that's great, but we need to do these things first. And then here's the other thing is, don't, for lack of a better term, don't criminalize behavior until it becomes deliberately, uh, intentionally disobedient, right? Recognize that a lot of times kids do something uh, that we don't want them to do. It's not because they're trying to be disobedient. It's just because they want to do something. And we have to recognize, if we can, let's work with that. And don't, you know, don't make it a, a big deal until they make it a big deal. And it's like, no, I'm, you, I understand your reasons, but I'm going to do it anyways. Okay, now, now it's a different deal. Now something else has changed. So don't criminalize their behavior until it becomes 
willful disobedience. Okay, uh, go back to the next slide. I think there's one more on there, which is lectures and... Um, oh, I, so I, I'm going to skip past conversation and lecture for a minute. We'll come back to that one in a minute. So we've talked about two tools for discipline. One is tie into the natural consequences. Two is negotiated agreement. Find a way to say yes. Help them to change their behavior or their desire so that you can say yes. We'll talk about conversation and lecture uh, at the end. Um, but let's go to kind of the negative or the, the um, restrictive uh, con tools for discipline. I told you I'd talk about this one, which is spanking or corporal, corp corporal punishment. I don't know why. I have a hard time saying that one. This one, obviously, is very um, controversial now. Uh, you have many people who feel like it's there's completely unacceptable to spank in any situation, that there's always another way. And I, I will say there's almost always... I, I'm going to say the, um, almost. I think there's always an alternative. But in my perspective, and you're free to disagree with me, but think about it and come to all of this, right? These are your kids. They're not my kids. Think about it. Um, all, as I said at the beginning, all coercive tools of discipline can be abusive. All tools of discipline where you are overriding their will, which is one of our principles. We, we do that as little as possible. We, we preserve their freedom of choice as much as possible because we recognize that we're, we're made to be their parents, but they're a human being with the same rights and thoughts and everything else that God gave them. When they become an adult, legally, they will do what they want. I want them to be equipped for that reality. Jonathan, yes. It's not punishment for punishment's sake. It is, it is a recognition of the fact that you have either made or you possibly could make. You, you used the, the concept of the toddler riding, running out into the street. That there's going to come a day when there's going to be a street to run into, and I'm not there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be there. I can't be there. So it's an attempt to establish right decision-making processes in the child. Within a safe... Within a safe, within a safe zone. So that when, I'm, when they have to make that same decision that they're making right now, that they either have made or potentially is going to make wrong, that they'll, there'll be something that will help them to make it correctly because I'm not there to make it for them. Right. So the operating principle, go to the next slide for me, Sarah, which is much of what you said. The operating principle... If you're going to think about spanking or corporal punishment, is this is physical pain. Let's not beat around the bush. Let's be honest with ourselves. This is physical pain as an immediate, shocking, disruptive, artificial consequence in situations where the child's behavior has severe consequences that are too abstract or too far away for them to really internalize. So from my, my opinion, spanking should be a last resort. And it should only be for severe and purposeful behavior. It should never come as a surprise. And you should be able to honestly tell yourself and them, and as I said, if you had a spouse, it's another good test, that this is honestly the best, in the best interest of the child. What that means is, can you say honestly that the physical pain that you're about to inflict is a better outcome than what the alternative would be in the natural consequence? So in that is a good example. I'm trying to give them something. So, uh, I'll point out, all the principles of discipline still apply. Don't forget our main goal is to raise adults. Don't forget this is God's child. We're stewards of this child that God has given to us. Don't forget that this is supposed to be founded on love. So if we're not doing this in a place where we love them, we need to step back. Don't forget these are full people. This is another human being. This isn't just your uh, pet or something. This is another person that you're doing to this. Um, so let's talk about how. Uh, go to the next slide for me, Sarah. If, if this is a method of discipline you choose to take, I recommend you choose a specific method of spanking that is painful. Otherwise, don't do it. Because what's the point, right? How, how, do, I, how do I say what I'm trying to say? Like the little boy that says, when the dad tells him, this hurts me, we're going to hurt you, but not in the same place. Not in the same place, exactly. <laughs> Like just, this, this is not a fun thing for you or for them. So don't, like, 
Don't half do it and have to do it a whole bunch more times. That's not, if you're going to do it, do it so you don't have to do it again, right? So it should be painful, but it should not cause permanent damage. For example, the, the bottom is a good place to spank. The upper thighs are a good place to spank. If you spank them hard enough that you leave, like, you know, the, my dad spanked me and I couldn't walk for three days, I'm not sure that's a good thing. I don't think that's the, the, the right way to use this tool. Um, it should not cause permanent damage. We'll go back to that humiliation thing, too. It, sh it also shouldn't leave them in a position where they have to explain to their friends, well, my dad, you know, I, I've got this bruise because i got to say, if you're leaving a bruise, rethink it. The purpose is not to hurt your child. The purpose is to give them a, an understandable, immediate negative consequence. This next one, I, th I, I, uh, I feel very strongly, don't use your hands. Spanking is a negative physical interaction. We talked about briefly how, how powerful touch is as a means of communicating emotion, right? We want our hands to communicate love, to communicate support, to communicate safety, to communicate care. I don't want them associated with pain. I don't want my children to go through pain at all, but that's not life. They're going to go through pain of life. I want them to be prepared for it. So for this reason, I, I advise you never strike your children with your hands. They're their hands are for healing. So my mom used a ping pong paddle on us. We've used a wooden spoon. But I recommend you choose something and be consistent with that. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to establish this is not a normal thing that we're doing. This is not how adults handle problems. This is not how you should handle your problems. This is a very specific thing that's happening because of a specific action you took as a consequence. But it's, it's not normal, and it, we don't want it. I don't want it. You don't want it. So that spanking stick comes out when I'm stirring soup, or you're getting the spanking. And, you know, ideally, separate entirely so you know. My mom didn't play ping pong, so if she had the ping pong paddle, you knew what was happening. So... If this is a choice, a discipline you use, give space and time for emotions to cool, yours and theirs. Take advantage of that sense of dread. I talked about that a little bit. Use that as a disciplinary tool itself, but don't let, don't let it be like a sword of Damocles hanging over their head that I know sometime dad's going to come and spank me. I just don't know when it's going to be. That's not healthy either, right? Uh, this should be an immediate consequence. And this goes back to that, you know, all... Uh, all course of discipline can be abusive if it's implied, improperly applied. As a general principle, um, like I said, be predictable. They should expect it. So we don't want to put them in this position where they're dreading, like, I don't know when the hammer is going to fall for any of our disciplines, spanking included. So give time for your emotions to subside for theirs, but don't make it too long. Do it in private. Having your spouse there is good. Um, but, you know, you don't want to spank your kids in front of others. You want to be mindful. Uh, like when you lay out consequences, if I'm in a restaurant, I might not use spanking as a, I mean, I'll probably, my ultimate, you know, if they do the worst thing they can possibly do, my ultimate consequence in the restaurant is we're going home, probably, right? Um, and then, of course, depending on behavior, we'll see what happens. But never spank out of frustration or anger. It should always and only be in response to their choices. It's not about me. It's about them. Uh, spanking often is a very, like I said, a last resort. Um, I, I will say this. Uh, spanking, I'm trying to find the right, word, right way to word this. I'm not happy with how I wrote it in my notes. Jesus said, all those who take the sword perish by the sword. One thing that spanking can teach, if you're careful, is that physical violence only begets more physical violence. If you, so I have used spanking primarily as a response to violent or abusive behavior towards others. Not towards me, because the last thing I want to do is cause a fight. If they're being violent towards me and I'm violent back, what am I teaching them? I solve these fights by violence. If they're violent towards me, I've got other tools to handle that. But if they're, you know, if they punch their sister after they know they're not supposed to, which you think would be obvious, but it seems like, you know. Or if they're, you know, being physically aggressive and, and beating up other children, like that... I want spanking to say, look, this is completely unacceptable behavior. There is no justification for what you've done, and this is the consequence. And spanking should be accompanied by words, right? Even in adulthood, violence is a possible response to violence, legally, right? What do, you, what do the police do if you're belligerent and you're assaulting someone and they show up and you assault them? 
They throw you on the ground, they put you in handcuffs, they subdue you, and then they take you to jail, right? So as a parent, we have to maintain incredible control. If you choose to spank, and you don't have to, it's not a method you have to use, you need to maintain strict control of yourself. You're trying to dissuade them from using violence as a tool to solve their problems. You don't want to accidentally show them this is how you solve your problems, right? Uh, I'll add two things there. Um, one is, again, I think it should only be used for willful choices when they purposefully are acting in a, uh, they, they know what they did, they did it on purpose. If they're just acting out of an emotional lack of control or you know, they're hungry, they're tired, and they're just not in control, I don't think spanking is productive. I think it can just escalate the situation, make the emotions bigger. Um, That's very good. Thank you for bringing that up. I think I had it in my notes, but I, I blew past it. So the operating principle is to create immediate, severe, negative consequence in response to immediate, severe, negative behavior in cases where the actual consequences are too delayed. You only have to do that for small children, right? I think for our children, we spanked our children. I'm not sure I'm entirely happy with, with how that went. I have regrets about but it was an effective tool for some of their behavior. Um, I think we stopped by what, like five or six? Because they're old enough for me to explain the problem. Right. They're old enough for me to talk them through it and tie the actual consequences to it. Yeah, I, th I, think, that's, I think that's the point. Like, if a, if a three-year-old yells and screams in the middle of a situation where they shouldn't yell or scream, there's no way to explain the negative consequences no way to get through why this is not an appropriate behavior, even though it clearly isn't. Whereas once you get to the to a six, seven, eight year old, you can say, look, if you do this behavior, I'm, I'm going to punish you, but it doesn't have to be physical. I'm going to, I'm going to help you to get to understand or tie something to it. But my real explanation for you is here's what's going to happen if down the road you're in another situation and you yell and scream in an inappropriate manner, this is what happens. People don't like you. They think you're crazy. They, they do all kinds of things, and it causes all kinds of backlash toward you. But you can't explain that to a three-year-old. Right. They have no, like, they have no consequences to that. So I think that's the distinction that I, we always try to make. So I know I'm, I'm coming close to my time, and I wanted to at least touch on the other two. So let me wrap up spanking here. And I spent a lot of time on this one because it is such a controversial thing and because I want to make sure that we don't um, cause our children harm in the attempt to help them. I'll add two other things. One is, uh, or one other thing, you should always bookend that, that particular discipline with explanation and love. And what I mean by bookend is before and after, right? Before they do the thing, they should understand the consequences. If they're going to suffer that consequence, you should explain to them, look, this was inappropriate, this was unacceptable, here's why, here's the consequence, because you don't understand. They might not understand it, but you still explain it to them, because you never know when they start sinking in. And the thing is, you want to transition away from this kind of thing as soon as possible. As soon as they're able to understand and reason with you, that's where you go. But, so you don't know when that is, you have to just try and see if, they, if it sunk in. And the same thing afterwards, you talk to them afterwards. Um, all right, so a couple things I want to point out. Dangers and warnings. So things to be, if you're going to take, use this as a disciplinary tool, things to be careful of. If in the process of spanking you feel anger, frustration, or that feeling of, well, they deserve it, stop. That's, I'm not saying you're being abusive, but that's not the right headspace to do this in a healthy way. If, you're, if you can't be calm and at peace, and regretful even in your spanking, don't do it. Not worth it. Your child, your child matters more. It should be rare. It should be a minority of your physical interactions with your kid. If spanking is the main way you touch them, it's not healthy. It's going to lead to problems. If, as a result of using this discipline, your child learns to fear you, take a big step back. The goal is not to make your child fear you. The goal is to make the child... Con uh, aware of and fearful of the consequences of negative behavior, not of you. And then finally, we have to remember this is driven by their choices, not who they are. 
I don't want to teach my child, well, you know, you deserve this. No, I'm using this as a negative reinforcement for very serious behavior. A lot of this is for you because at the age you're probably spanking, your kid's not going to understand this, but it's incredibly important that you have the right mindset. Yeah. Personally, I would hesitate to use my hand just out of an abundance of caution. However, I think the principle applies. And that's what we're doing is I think you should be able to think through this yourself. And you know your kid, right? Um, you don't want to associate your hands with negative painful, but that might not be what's happening. He may be able to clearly distinguish the difference between, you know, this and that, in which case I say use your, use your best judgment. Absolutely. You, you might need to spank in others you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, my kids, some of them got spanking more than others. <laughs> um, and some of them got spanking older, way older than others. But mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think that plays a huge role. How I was raised, I think all of us got spanking, a lot of them. But I needed them. <laughs> I know I needed them. But, you know, my kids are different. It's, you know, how I raised them. My dad didn't talk to us at all because he wasn't raised like that. Right. But with us, it's different because we know better, so we talk to our kids. Leo, I have to explain a lot of things to Leo because he would not accept a no. But, you know, right. it's just different. Child analogy. It's, it's really, I think it's really unique uh, with each child. Um, what the physical punishment was the least effective manner of Jessica would, if she thought that I was disappointed in her behavior, she would correct the behavior because she wanted to please me. Sam, if he thought I was, if he, if he thought I was disappointed in his behavior, he would shut down. So I had to be careful that I couldn't express this disappointment. I had to, I had to help him to understand that you can do better. And physical punishment did nothing to help me in that. Like you, you made a bad choice, but you can make a better choice. And here's how to do that. Landon, the anticipation of whatever was going to happen that was the main motivating factor for him. Um, he, he, he didn't really care that I was disappointed. He was not disappointed in himself. He, didn't want, he, he just didn't want the consequences of whatever the consequences were going to be. So his preferred method of punishment was spanking because he just got it over with. Like, like, I just want it done, I just want it through, and I'm finished, yeah, right? I'll, I'll do the time. i that I've yep. my life and do exactly what I was doing before, whereas um, if you made him delay and think and the punishment was something that, like washing dishes that he had to anticipate every day, I'm going to have to do this, that, that was much more motivating to him. I'll give you the example. I, I wanted to touch on, which I won't today, I may, this may leak over again. Because there's, there's timeouts are another very effective tool when they're used well. They can be very ineffective when they're not used well, but they can be extremely effective. And I think they lay the principle for all sorts of very healthy ways of discipline as they grow. Um, that's one that can grow with them. And then the, the main one is conversation and lectures. Um, can you go to that slide real quick, Sarah? I do at least want to give you the operating principle because it seems obvious, but rational, logical, empathetic communication is the pattern for a healthy relationship. That's the way to have healthy relationships between adults, between children, when we talk to each other with the intent to understand, to understand how they think, how they feel, and to communicate the same back to them. We'll talk about how to do that probably next time. But um, to round out corporal punishment, with our children, <laughs> Sarah, you can, you can help me remember, Elijah, <coughs> Elijah, this was very effective because it signaled to him something that was very, I, 
how many times, it was very rare that we had to spank Elijah, that we ever used, I don't want to say had, that maybe three times. It was when he had some behavior that he had decided, I'm going to do this regardless of what the consequences were. And then it was like, no, the consequences will scale with the behavior. And he'd go, this is serious. I don't want this again. I'm going to change my behavior. It was extremely effective for him. For Rylan, I think we've never, we never spanked her. Um, and it wasn't that we felt bad about spanking and chose not to, but the circumstances where I felt like it would be an effective uh, consequence were never necessary. She learned from her siblings. Adele is one I wish I'd spanked less because she was the one that, well, what would happen is she'd get emotional and upset and then she'd become defiant and angry. And then she'd push, she'd push, push until I had to, I'm going to be consistent with what I told you. This was the line. You crossed the line. You've got to suffer the consequence. That's the fundamental principle of good discipline. But what I recognize is at some point, like if I keep letting her do this, I'm just going to end up beating her. Yeah. And there, there was one in particular I remember. I'd given her a spanking and she didn't, you know, nothing. Like she screamed, she's angry, continued to hurl abuse and be... You know, she, I forget how old she was. And I was like, if you don't, if you don't stop. Or, no, what it was is was I, she, she refused to sit still so I could give her a spanking. So like, if you don't let me swat you on the bottom, I'm going to swat you on the legs if you don't stop. And I'm not going to chase you. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to do this whole thing. You're going to come to me, and we're going to get this over with and done. And I had to swat her on the legs, and I had to swat her like two or three times. And I was like, I don't ever want to do that again. This is not an effective discipline for her. And what I recognized with her was she would get so emotionally worked up, she's not thinking rationally. Logical thought is out the window. So this is not doing anything good for her. It's, she's not learning from the consequences. She's just getting more and more worked up. So she was probably the one I've had the most conversations with um, about discipline. And she was the one that really made me feel like I'd arrived as a father. When she said, you know, I, there was a day where she'd done something. We were going to talk about it. And she said, can you just spank me instead? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> All right, I've succeeded. And the reason, the reason is because, and I'll, I'll dig into this more next time, and I, I know I'm over time. I appreciate your patience. Um, when we do it right, those kinds of conversations with our children hold them accountable for their emotions and their, for their actions. And we force them to not lie to themselves about what they did. You chose to act this way knowing how it would hurt somebody else, knowing that it would feed into your own anger, knowing that it would lead to further bad decisions. That's not something you can pretend didn't happen. We have to talk about that. We have to talk about why you chose that and figure out what we're going to do. That's a very painful process. It's a very stretching process. We'll talk about it more. My alarm's going off. I'm, I'm well over my time. Our children are worth the time. They deserve the best chance they have to regulate their own emotions, to regulate their own thought, to have the strongest start in life. And a big part of that is them learning how to regulate their own behavior. Not so that they can do what we want them to do, but so that they can do what they choose to do and not just be ruled by their passions and pushed around by the circumstances of life. Thank you for your time. I hope this has been beneficial. Um, we'll probably close out our conversation on tools of discipline with, with the last two, and then we'll move into communication. Uh, next week. So we'll take